In each of the songs tonight, we have been singing about one glorious truth, and it's this, Jesus will come again. Now, when you hear that statement, Jesus will come again, I wonder, honestly, what is sparked off in your thinking by that statement? I won't be telling you anything you don't know when I say that for a vast number of people, that statement is, quite frankly, ridiculous. It, it's now perceived as very out of place in our modern world. You know, this is, this is the 21st century. Surely we should all have moved on by now. And so, with this widespread skepticism, cynicism, I need to underline something as we begin our consideration of this topic. This is Christianity 101. This is not a fringe belief, a side issue. It's something that is foundational to the Christian faith. It's something that lies at the very heart of what Christians believe. It is central to the teaching of the New Testament. And as we shall see next week, it's actually central to the teaching of the Old Testament. The belief that Jesus will return to our world is the historic hope of the Christian church. Each and every Christian is biblically bound to live out their life in light of the certain return of their Lord and Saviour. So it's, it's really vital that we understand this. We are not talking about something that is a a secondary matter, something that, you know, if you're sort of investigating or thinking about the Christian faith, you know, this is in the optional column. But honesty demands that something else is said at the beginning of this mini series of talks on the Lord's return. Whilst it is true that all Christians believe Jesus is coming again. It's not true that all Christians agree on how it will happen. There are differing understandings of the sequence of events that will accompany the Lord's return. It is a matter of regret that at times, Christians have not managed to disagree agreeably. And there's a painful irony in this. The great truth of our returning Lord, which the New Testament holds out as our common hope, has been used to divide believers, to foster contention to question the sincerity and integrity of other Christians who understand the scriptures differently. Now that is a sad admission, but it is a necessary one. And in light of it, I believe it is really important to bring front and center what all Christians agree on concerning the Lord's return, notwithstanding our differing perspectives on the sequence of events that will accompany the Lord's return. 
We need to keep the main thing the main thing. Especially when communicating the truth of the Lord's return to an unbelieving world. What do unbelievers think when they see believer running down fellow believer refusing to fellowship together because they hold to differing prophetic schemes of interpretation. I suspect unbelievers see more of the pathetic than the prophetic. So let me state what all Christians believe about the return of Jesus. On this we unite. The return of Jesus to our world will be personal, visible, and glorious. It will be personal. That means it will be the same Jesus who entered our world 2,000 years ago, who was crucified, who rose again from the dead with a glorified human body, who ascended into heaven, who will return. Acts chapter 1 verse 11. The angel spoke to the disciples of Jesus and said this. Men of Galilee, why do you stand here looking into the sky? This same Jesus, who has been taken from you into heaven, will come back. In the same way you have seen him go into heaven. It will be personal. It will be visible. Revelation chapter 1 verse 7. Look, he is coming with clouds. And every eye will see him. Even those who pierced him. And all the peoples of the earth will mourn because of him. It will be personal, it will be visible, and it will be glorious. The Lord Jesus himself said, recorded in Luke 21 verse 27, At that time they will see the Son of Man coming in a cloud with power and great glory. So let's not miss the wood for the trees. As we consider the return of Christ, that is what we're thinking about. The personal, visible, glorious return of Jesus. Now the particular aspect we're thinking about this evening is encapsulated in the two-word title. Jesus is coming. Says who? After all, anyone can claim Jesus is coming. But upon what authority is that statement made? Why should it be taken seriously? At one level, of course, the answer to that question is that it's the church who says so. And it's individual Christians who comprise the church who say so. That is correct. For the proclamation of Jesus' return is an integral part of the church's message for our world. And this evening, I stand in solidarity with and in continuity with 2,000 years of Christian insistence that Jesus will return to our world. But there's an obvious objection to this. Why should you take seriously what I, or indeed any other Christian, says? What authority do I have in myself to make this sweeping pronouncement That Jesus is coming again. And the answer to that is of course. That none of us 
possess any authority in ourselves to say that Jesus is coming. When Christians proclaim the return of Christ, they are simply standing on the authority of someone else. And that someone else is Jesus Christ. It is not an oversimplification to say that the reason we can know that Jesus will return to our world is because he told us that he would. The authority behind the church's proclamation that Jesus is coming back is none other than Jesus Christ. This is the heart of the issue. Let me read you something that Jesus said. The context is that Jesus is speaking to his disciples, his close followers, on the night before his crucifixion. As he is preparing to leave our world, to go back to his Father in heaven via the cross, this is what he says to his followers. I'm going to read you this in the New Living Translation just to freshen it up for you. Jesus says this, Do not let your hearts be troubled. You believe in God. Believe also in me. My father's house has many rooms. If that were not so, would I have told you that I am going there to prepare a place for you? And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come back and take you to be with me that you also may be where I am. This passage alone forces us to choose. Jesus explicitly pins his integrity to his return. If these things were not so, would, would I have told you them? In fact, it's not only his integrity that is on the line. His very identity is as well. Jesus called on his disciples to believe in him, to trust in him in exactly the same way that they trusted in God. You believe in God, believe also in me. Within two sentences of those words, Jesus made his famous declaration, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes unto the Father except through me. Well, Jesus cannot be the truth if he does not tell the truth. The reason Christians believe Jesus is coming again is because he said he was. Now, maybe you think that is placing too much trust and confidence in him. And let's be honest, the consequences of accepting that Jesus will return to our world are utterly life-changing. So let me remind you who made this promise that he would return. Jesus Christ, the saviour of sinners, appeared in our world some 2,000 years ago. But he did not arrive on the stage of human history 
unannounced. For centuries beforehand, God had spoken through his prophets, describing in advance what this promised saviour would be like when he came. And Jesus matched the profile perfectly. He was born in the right place. Bethlehem, the prophecy of Micah. He was born in the right line. He was a descendant of the house and lineage of David, Isaiah's prophecy. Samuel, prophecy. He was born of a virgin, the Virgin Mary, Isaiah's prophecy. In his three years of public ministry, Jesus demonstrated again and again and again who he was. He taught with heavenly authority, which mesmerized people and confounded his critics. He displayed divine compassion for the outcast, the rejects, the write-offs. He revealed the heart of God to men. He himself was demonstrated at every turn to be completely free of any sinful imperfection. He healed the sick. He stilled the storm. He raised the dead. And he made promises. He promised that he would go to the cross to pay for sin. He promised that he would rise again from the dead. He promised that he would return to his Father in heaven. He promised that he would send the Holy Spirit into the world. He promised that he would build his church. And he promised he would come again. When I say to you that I believe that Jesus is coming again, please understand that all that Jesus has proved himself to be and all that Jesus has already delivered upon pours into my acceptance of that promise. Really what I am saying is this. Jesus' promise to come again is one of a set. You shouldn't detach it from everything else that Jesus has said and done. Is the return of the Son of God to our world any more difficult to accept than his coming into our world as a little baby? The eternal son of God? Is it any more difficult to accept that he would die as a sacrifice for the sins of the world? Is it any more difficult to accept that on the third day he defeated death and undid death? Is it any more difficult to believe than him taking a dozen men in a backwoods and saying through your words countless millions of sinners will be brought into my family. Perhaps you came here this evening expecting to be in a very dramatic talk and perhaps presented with various signs that would suggest that the coming of the Lord is near. And there's certainly a lot of that out there, as any quick search of the internet will show, and I would issue a health warning with much of that, if you're inclined to do that. Here's something we need to understand 
about signs of the Lord's return. Even genuine signs. Signs do not make the Lord's return any more certain. They indicate its closeness, not its certainty. If you could look out at our world today and see nothing to suggest that the stage is being set for Jesus' return, it would not be 0.1 of 1% less likely to happen. Because Jesus' return rests upon the authority of his word. It is a great tragedy when Christians become so preoccupied with signs of Christ's return, rashly matching up personalities and events with things that are described in the Bible, with the result that the focus is then taken off Christ and placed onto their failed predictions. It discredits our message and detracts from the real source of authority, which is the word of Christ himself. What I want to do for a few minutes is to expand our understanding of the authority upon which the claim that Jesus will return is based. And that takes us to another promise that Jesus made, that Jesus gave when he was here on earth. As he prepared to leave his disciples, the apostles, he left them with this assurance. They would not be on their own as they continued to witness to Jesus in the world. Jesus would send the Holy Spirit to indwell them, to empower them, and to enlighten them. This is what Jesus said, John 16, verse 13. When he, the Spirit of truth, comes, he will guide you into all truth and will tell you what is yet to come. Jesus is telling his apostles they will receive new revelation from the Holy Spirit explaining more of God's unfolding plan. The chain of authority continues from what Christ said to his disciples when he was with them to the Holy Spirit to what the Holy Spirit later revealed to the apostles, which is contained for us in the New Testament. And I want to spend the remaining time simply sharing with you something of what Christ's apostles had revealed to them by the Holy Spirit about the Lord's return as Jesus said they would. And I'm going to read to you some words from the Apostle Peter, the Apostle John, and the Apostle Paul. And what I would ask you to note is the two sides to the truth of the Lord's return that each writer presents. On the one hand, the return of Christ will bring indescribable blessing to those who are in relationship with God through Jesus. While on the other hand, Christ's return will bring untold misery to those who are outside of that relationship with God through Jesus. 
The Apostle Peter has written two letters that we have in our New Testament. In his first letter, Peter is writing to Christians who are suffering for their faith. Because of their allegiance, their loyalty to Jesus, they are on the sharp end of an unbelieving world. Peter writes to them. He tells them, he acknowledges that unlike him, you haven't seen Jesus with your eyes, but you love him. And you are living your lives in light of his return. And so he encourages them in chapter 1, verse 13. He tells them to do this. These suffering Christians who love Jesus, though they haven't seen him, but they're looking for his return. And Peter tells them to set their hope fully on the grace that is to be given them when Jesus Christ is revealed. So please note that Christ's return will be a wonderful experience of the grace of God for his people. It carries no threat whatsoever when Jesus is revealed. Rather, it already fills his people with joy because they know it's going to be a grace-filled encounter with their Savior. But listen. Listen to what Peter also had revealed to him by the Holy Spirit, which he writes in his second letter. Listen to these words from chapter 3. Peter writes, first of all, you must understand that in the last days, scoffers will come, scoffing and following their own evil desires. They will say, where is this coming he promised? (laughs) Ever since our fathers died, everything goes on as it has since the beginning of creation. But they deliberately forget that long ago, by God's word, the heavens existed and the earth was formed out of water and by water. By these waters, the world of that time was deluged and destroyed by the same word that created, that called for judgment, by that same word. The present heavens and earth are reserved for fire, being kept for the day of judgment and destruction of ungodly men. But do not forget this one thing, dear friends. With the Lord, a day is like a thousand years, and a thousand years are like a day. The Lord is not slow in keeping his promise, as some understand slowness. He is patient with you, not wanting anyone to perish, but everyone to come to repentance. But the day of the Lord will come like a thief. The heavens will disappear with a roar. The elements will be destroyed by fire and the earth and everything in it will be laid bare. The return of Christ, according to the Apostle Peter, brings blessing to the people of God, but judgment and destruction to those who are without Christ. The Apostle John agrees. Some of the most beautiful words in all of Scripture are found in John's first letter, chapter 3. This is what John writes to his fellow Christians. How great is the love 
the Father has lavished on us that we should be called the children of God. And that is what we are. The reason the world does not know us is that it did not know him. Dear friends, now we are children of God and what we will be has not yet been made known, but we know that when he appears, we shall be like him, for we shall see him as he is. Now contrast that prospect, that hope, with what the Apostle John writes concerning the return of Christ and its implications for an unbelieving world. Now this is apocalyptic language. It is full of symbolism, but the symbolism is there so we get the emotional impact of what is being described. This comes from Revelation 19. John describes what he sees. I saw heaven standing open, and there before me was a white horse, whose rider is called Faithful and True. With justice, he judges and makes war. His eyes are like blazing fire, and on his head are many crowns. He has a name written on him that no one knows but he himself. He is dressed in a robe dipped in blood, and his name is the Word of God. The armies of heaven were following him. Riding on white horses and dressed in fine linen, white and clean. Out of his mouth comes a sharp sword with which to strike down the nations. He will rule them with an iron scepter. He treads the winepress of the fury of the wrath of God Almighty. On his robe and on his thigh, he has a name written, King of Kings and Lord of Lords. The Apostle Paul agrees with both Peter and John. The return of Christ ushers in the eternal blessedness blessedness of the saints and the eternal misery of those without Christ. Paul writes to the believers in the city of Philippi, he says this, our citizenship is in heaven and we eagerly await a saviour from there, the Lord Jesus Christ, who by the power that enables him to bring everything under his control will transform our lowly bodies so that they will be like his glorious body. Paul writes to the Christians in another city in Thessalonica and he tells them that they need not grieve over the death of their fellow Christians in some sort of hopeless fashion. Why? Because the Lord himself will come down from heaven with a loud command, with the voice of the archangel and with the trumpet call of God, and the dead in Christ will rise first. After that, we who are still alive and are left will be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. And so we will be with the Lord forever. How different for those outside of Christ when Jesus returns to our world. To that same church in the city of Thessalonica, 
Paul wrote these words in 2 Thessalonians chapter 1. When the Lord Jesus is revealed from heaven in blazing fire with his powerful angels, he will punish those. Listen to this. He will punish those who do not know God and do not obey the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ. They will be punished with everlasting destruction from the presence of the Lord and from the majesty of his power on the day he comes to be glorified in his holy people and to be marveled at among all those who have believed. So let me bring you back to the title of our subject for this evening. Jesus is coming? Says who? The answer to that question is that it is Jesus Christ who says so. He did in straightforward language when he was with his disciples and he did so again in a much fuller way through the revelation given to his apostles through the Holy Spirit. Over the next two Sunday evenings, God willing, we're going to think more about what is involved in the Lord's return. The title for next week is Unfinished Business. We need to understand that the return of Christ is absolutely indispensable if Jesus is truly the Messiah, God's promised deliverer. I think you will find next week fascinating as we see the return of Christ taught in the pages of the Old Testament. The title for our final week is Why It's Good to Groan, which may be of immediate appeal to some. But it will take us into the whole area of the Christian's hope, which is actually a cosmic hope. We'll think about the thrilling future ahead for the people of God and all creation which lies on the other side of Christ's return and is contingent upon it. But I want to finish with some final words from Jesus concerning his return. Oh, that the Spirit of God would take these words and plant them deep in every heart here tonight. This is the Son of God speaking about his return and he warns us in advance that the world will be unprepared for his coming. Jesus said, just as it was in the days of Noah, so will it also be in the days of the Son of Man. People were eating, drinking, marrying and being given in marriage up to the day Noah entered into the ark. Then the flood came and destroyed them all. It was the same in the days of Lot. People were eating and drinking Buying and selling, planting and building. But the day Lot left Sodom, fire and sulfur rained down from heaven and destroyed them all. It will be just like this on the day the Son of Man is revealed. Do you hear? 
what Jesus is saying. He will return to a distracted world. He will find sinners caught up in the busyness of life without any thought of being ready to meet him. It is your prerogative and mine to choose whether to take Jesus' words seriously. Jesus is coming. He has told us so. Are you ready to meet him?